The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. This is Tony Mizuko, national political correspondent for BaseNet Internet Television, coming to you from our studios in Boston, Massachusetts, with my co-host Michael Dow for today's episode of Viewpoint. And here today we also have the director of programming for BaseNet Internet Television, Ed Jupin. And Ed's going to go ahead and give you guys a brief introduction, and then we're going to move on with today's show. Hey guys, uh, thanks for having me here on this brand new uh, show, Viewpoint, with Tony Mizuko and Michael Dow. And uh, we are looking forward to covering a lot of interesting political topics here. Uh, both ends of the spectrum, far left, far right, right down the middle. Um, maybe we'll even stick in a libertarian viewpoint here or there. I know uh, we're going to have a lot of interesting topics. We really anticipate in this program running through the presidential election season next year. Um, not to say that Tony or Michael will be available for every show. They'll either do it separately or we could bring on other guest co-hosts. But I think ideally we'd like this program to run at least through the presidential election. And then if we need to go even further and it's successful, we could bring it beyond the presidential election and cover some local elections. So again, I want to welcome you guys both to BaseNet and welcome this new show to the lineup. New episodes of this show will be airing Wednesdays. So whenever this show is recorded, the following Wednesday is when it will appear online, just so that our listeners could get into a habit. We are ultimately shooting for this show to be weekly, but, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. Again, um, we'll see how the availability of all of the hosts are, and if we need to do it bi-weekly or monthly, we'll do it that way, but we'll bring it to you as often as feasible, and we'll try to keep it interesting. So, Tony and Michael, it's your, all yours, and again, thanks for um, having the show. And thanks, Ed. I just wanted to introduce myself at least briefly to uh, subscribers to the podcast and to BaseNet. So my, my name is Michael Dow, and I'm actually a professor of film studies uh, and art history at a couple of universities around Boston. I'm not much of a political science person. I never actually had a class to speak of. So hopefully, uh, along with my providing some counterpoint to Tony's expertise, I'll be learning a lot about alternative viewpoints, politically speaking. So it should be an education for me as much as for the listeners, maybe even more so. Thank you, Michael, for that. And just to let the audience know, I am a bit of a political science scientist, having completed an undergraduate degree in political science and a master's degree in public administration. So you really have two very different ends of the spectrum here on uh, BaseNet, on Viewpoint. And I think we're going to go ahead and jump right into the first segment of our show, which is our news segment. And I'm going to read a couple of different articles. Michael and I are going to see if we can come to any agreement about them and maybe even inform you, the listeners out there, a little bit about something you didn't know before you started on the show. So the first article I have here comes from CNN, and it's 26 bodies found in western Mexico. I'm just going to read you a couple of little clips here. It says, authorities found 26 bodies Thursday inside three abandoned vehicles in Guadalajara, Mexico. All of the victims were men. The vehicles were discovered near a monument in one of the city's main avenues, state-run news agency reported. Now, we hear news coming out of Mexico all the time, and Mexico is often thought about only in terms of immigration as an issue. But I think, and Michael, tell me if you agree or you disagree, but there's immigration, there's border control, and then there's the fact that Mexico is descending into a failed state. And how are we reacting to that? What's going on along the border and in Mexico is in some ways as bad as what's happening in Afghanistan or Iraq or Pakistan, and I don't think we're doing anything about it. Michael, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I think I, it's going to be difficult because I don't think you can necessarily separate the political or the economic concerns there with the humanitarian concerns. And if you think about even what some uh, someone is, let's say, politically rabid to the right as Newt Gingrich, uh, even he had a kind of humanitarian plea this past week about our not being able to ignore the conditions, certainly of immigrants in this, in this country, but... I think you can extend that likewise to the uh, concerns of the Mexican people as well. I don't think we can necessarily simply ignore the crisis immediately to you know the other side of the border here. And it's funny, I don't know if this necessarily comes into play, but 
if you remember really 10 years ago, it was just prior to 9-11, the way in which we were trying to uh, produce some kind of economic reform relative to our relations with Mexico, how George Bush was cozying up with Vicente Fox back then. Uh, that's something I think it's at the very least has been on the back burner for a long time. And I think given the immediacy, ge the geographic immediacy, as well as the political economic immediacy, I think we need to have some kind of uh, uh, active focus there on reform, whether it be focused primarily on the concerns relative to immigration or you know, as you were mentioning, the, the crisis that they're experiencing on their own terms as well. So I think that there's a kind of working duality there, and I think we need to focus on both more or less simultaneously. I would agree. I, I want to add that I think ultimately the way we need to look at it as a country in the United States is the problems that Mexico is facing are our fault. Now, I'm by no means a, uh, a sympathetic bleeding heart, but if you look at it, the majority of the violence in Mexico is drug violence. And that violence 10 or 15 years ago was in Colombia, and largely it's been eradicated from Colombia, and now it's moved to Mexico. And it's the drugs that we consume in this country. You and I? Yeah, well, we as a country, let's say. Okay. Uh, not necessarily myself personally, but um, it's the drugs that we consume that's really leading to this violence. And, you know, it's causing a lot of problems in Mexico, and it's spilling over the border. And, again, it's, it's so much broader than just the issue of immigration, but I think it's really something that, you know, we're doing it in America and we're we're hurting hurting the people down in Mexico and turning around and hurting us. So I think maybe morally or culturally, we need to look at what it is we're doing or what it is that we're not doing that we just cannot seem to fix this insatiable appetite we have in this country for illegal drugs that has led to these cartels, which, by the way, the total income of the cartels in Mexico averages between eight and ten billion dollars a year. That's more than Israel spends on their defense. So it starts to get you a little worried about what these cartels are uh you know, what they're going to be able to purchase with their money. Well, sure. Do you then feel that the entire, given, you know, your point of view then, do you feel that the whole war on drugs business that we've been dealing with for the past 25 years, do we have to finally admit that that's a failed policy? You know, I think with the war on drugs, it might be one of those things where you sort of, you're, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. I mean, on the one hand, if the drug cartels have helicopters and submarines, which they do, and radar and all this, how can we not have the same technology at least to sort of meet what they're coming at us with. We can't just have a couple of local yokel sheriffs down in Texas with some revolvers driving around in a beat up old pickup truck if they're sitting there flying helicopters over and stuff like that and digging tunnels under the ground. So I wouldn't say that we need to necessarily stop the war on drugs because again, what do we, if it's only gonna give the cartels an upper hand, but I think we need to realize that the war on drugs isn't necessarily gonna be won through military and police action because that's what happened in Colombia. In, in a sense, we did win by arming the Colombians and sending troops down there and giving them tons of money. But what happened? The demand for the drugs was still there, so it shifted to Mexico. Mexico's put a lot of time and energy into it. And I think if you take the, if we give them more money and we give them troops and tanks and guns and, and stealth bombers, whatever they want, sure, they can probably kick the, uh, kick the drug problem out of Mexico. And it's going to hit into Guatemala or Costa Rica or, one of the, or Panama, one of the other weaker states in Central America. So I think we need to change the war on drugs. And it really needs to be a cultural war that we have to fight you know, in a sense, among ourselves. Otherwise, we're never going to fix this problem. It's going to go from country to country to country. I, well, I tend to agree with you overall. I just think that uh, the whole problem with the war on drugs seemed to me much more of a, a sloganeering mission. And it often it, it causes me to wonder the degree to which how much of that really was some kind of a ruse or a smokescreen relative to our true dealings, our actual dealings with Mexico and, and South America. The degree to which, you know, we were much more actively involved, let's say, in in the, what do you want to call it, an underground industry than we were ever likely or willing to, to admit. Yeah, I think it's definitely possible. I think it's one of those issues in American culture or in American politics, I should say today, that's far more complex and far deeper than anyone wishes to, uh, to really get into. And I don't think there's a simple solution, but the problem started with us, and I think the solution starts with us as well. But let's move on to a, uh, a different topic. I have another article here that comes from... The Telegraph, the UK, and it says, Iran arrests 12 CIA spies accused of targeting nuclear program. An influential Iranian parliamentarian has said that the country has arrested 12 agents of the American Central Intelligence Agency, the, the country's official IRNA news agency reported. Now, you know, I read this article, and the first thing I said is, you know, it's definitely possible. I'm sure we have intelligence assets on the ground. I'm sure they're spying and trying to disrupt the Iranian nuclear program. But I wonder how true this might be. Uh, Iran does stuff like this all the time, and 
you just question whether or not they're actually CIA agents. Not to say that their sacrifices, if they are, are, not, uh, are no less noble, but sometimes these are in-country agents, these are assets, people we've hired or paid. But you just, you can't trust Iran, and I just wonder if that, you know, I wonder if that happens. But the issue this made me really think of is, have our human intelligence uh, strengths and, and operations degraded so much that, you know, we, the superpower, can't successfully conduct operations in Iran? I mean, Michael, would you agree with me on that? Disagree with me that? Well, again, it, it all depends. I think that there's a certain amount of paranoia there as well. Um, there's a quote from, uh, and I'm going to probably mangle his name, but whatever. There was a uh, senior Iranian official named Parviz Sorori who actually claimed as a result of the arrests of these supposed agents that it is a U.S. and Zionist conspiracy or it's a conspiracy relative to the U.S. and Zionist uh, regime. So there's a kind of sense that, you know, there's maybe some kind of paranoia uh, relative to the arrest. I'm not necessarily sure necessarily how true it is, but I think that there there is an act of concern that we can't really uh, get ourselves inside and really figure out truly what's happening with Iran. What concerns me is that that they use this as a publicity tool to argue again that, you know, the, the Americans are teaming up with the Zionists, quote, end quote, and this idea that, you know, Iran is the is the kind of whipping boy here politically on, a, on an international level. So that I think there's a problem there. And, and to the degree to which that is kind of trumped up paranoia or the degree to which there's some actual concern there, I think is um, something, there's some, there's some relative substance there, I suppose. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to take off my political scientist hat for a moment. And, you know, sometimes when you know a couple and there, there's a lot of tension between that couple, you often say they should just screw and get it over with. I think between the Iran and the United States, th there's a lot of tension there, and they need to just screw and get it over with. I think sure. this article is a result of, of saber-rattling on the part of Iran, and it just seems like we constantly are going back and forth with Iran, where, you know, we're, we're putting news stories out about these massive bunker-busting bombs, and then they come back with, well, they caught a bunch of CIA spies, and it just goes back and forth and back and forth. And I'm, I'm in no way advocating war with Iran, but I think at some point something is going to break. Something needs to happen that is going to end this because it's just going back and forth. And I think you're right that there, I wouldn't be surprised if the United States and Israel have assets in, in Iran and they are spying on the Iranians, but who knows? They're trying to, I think, win as much political favor as they can. They want to win some favor in the Middle East, uh, you know, by pointing to Israel and the United States. And I think that's in particular because the Arab League recently voted to, uh, or, or, you know, voted against Syria. And I'm sure that Iran wants to try to keep the Arab League and keep some of those Arab nations, Iran not being an Arab nation, just, uh, for the listeners out there, but to try to keep them from turning against Iran by pointing to Israel. But I think it's just, it's getting to the point where, you know, something needs to happen and something's going to break and hopefully it's not violence, but I don't know. There's a lot of tension and eventually tension needs to boil over somehow. Well, I agree. So, I mean, what would you actually suggest be our action against Iran relative to this case? Is this going to be another situation where we can send Al Gore in to save our agents? <laughs> you know, negotiate, or is it something more serious than that? Guys, I think clearly it, it would, I, I, I would think that it's undoubted that we have CIA agents working in there. Is it just a matter of fact that Iran is actually uh, genuinely blowing our cover, or is this some kind of smokescreen of sorts? Yeah, I, I'd be, I think we can't go the, not that I would ever suggest sending Al Gore or Jimmy Carter in there, especially not Jimmy Carter, they probably shoot him on sight. But um, we just don't know if these are, and it sounds terrible because these could very well be, you know, young American guys and, and they're out there risking their lives for us. But I think the issue is we just can't trust Iran. As for what I think should happen, we need to continue intelligence operations. I mean, as cold as this might sound, if we're going to lose a few CIA agents, I'd rather lose a few CIA agents than a few thousand troops. I mean, it, it does to a, to a certain extent just become, you know, what's the greater good. But I think in the last couple of uh, Republican debates, Newt Gingrich has actually made a lot of sense where he said, absolutely, we need to have intelligence assets on the ground. We need to sabotage their nuclear facilities. We need to sabotage their gas production facilities and do it in a way that is as deniable as possible. And that's really going to be what starts to bring down the Iranian regime. The key word there is deniable. Obviously, if we're sabotaging a, uh, you know, a military installation and we get caught, we sort of lose that deniability. But I think you see this with the Stuxnet virus. I guess I'm a fan of this because I'd prefer everything we're doing intelligence-based as opposed to actually sending troops in or getting involved in a war. And I don't think the United States is going to jump to, you know, launch an attack on, uh, on Iran. But, you know, the Israelis may feel that they're threatened and they may feel they need to do something. And I honestly, I think the Israelis may feel that by hitting Iran, they can get the United States involved, which is unfortunately probably the truth. 
And ultimately, you know, Israel's got to do what they think is bad in their best security interests. But I'd rather continue on this road, even though there's a cost to it, than possibly escalating to a full scale conflict. I would agree. I, and I definitely don't think necessarily that we want to make some kind of active uh, conflict on the ground, so to speak, with Iran, given that we need basically, and here I am kind of being the pessimist, but we, we, we need basically the, the token enemy. And we need somebody basically that we can inflate in a kind of yellow journalist way to, to um, you know, uh, uh, make the kind of what, what's the phrase, the straw man, basically. We need somebody basically who is going to be the big, you know, the boogeyman of the moment. And Iran has served that purpose, I think, for the past five or six years. I mean, again, going back in the history of the past 10 years or so, weren't we the ones pretty much who made Iran far more powerful than it otherwise would be relative to the invasion of Iraq and, and the business in the Middle East elsewise? Right. I, I mean, even going back to supporting the Shah, I mean, what happened in Iran when the Ayatollahs took over is very similar to what happened in Egypt. We supported uh, Mubarak for so long, and we supported a strong man who sort of kept that radical element at bay. But when people have, you know, a lack of access to their state institutions, that's when people tend to rebel. And it's happened in Egypt. It happened in Iran 30, 40 years ago, as opposed to other Middle East states we're seeing it now. So I think you're right. I mean, we sometimes create our own enemy, whether it's out of a necessity to have that enemy or just, you know, not looking too far down the political uh, political spectrum. I'll close with one more thing before we move on to the next article. It's funny you mentioned uh, about how we're trumping up Iran. And if you watch the Republican primary debates, every time it comes around to Ron Paul, he is very adamant about, is Iran really a threat? They don't even have missiles that could reach us. They may only have one nuclear weapon. So there's, there's that libertarian view that uh, Ed had mentioned earlier that comes in that some people are just... If you really step back and look at it, it, it's not whether we should or shouldn't be involved in Iran. It's whether they're really a threat. And to be honest with you, I guess that uh, remains to be discussed and, and debated by the experts. But I'm going to oh, go ahead. Well, Tony, well, Tony, just quickly, it's not that we necessarily want to have this whole side topic, but we could maybe talk about uh, in a future tense uh, the issue concerning Pakistan, because it seems to me that between Iran and Pakistan, uh, I'm much more actively concerned about what's going on with Pakistan. You know, so just to is, is maybe a bit of raw meat to throw out there, I think. Well, let's run with it for a minute, because I'll, I'll bring up, you know, I, I, brief side side note. I hate the term too big to fail, and I think that the federal government should absolutely be able to ban certain phrases, and that should be one of them. But this came up at the national security debate that perhaps Pakistan is too big to fail, because it is, I think, the sixth biggest country in the world. There's 150 or 60 million people there. They actually have nuclear weapons. They're a hotbed of radical activism. And, and Pakistan, you know, while possibly they couldn't launch a missile and hit the United States, they could certainly launch one at New Delhi and cause a whole lot of problems in India. And I mean, you, you're right that the world could absolutely become inflamed. And Pakistan has a chance of descending into a failed state that would want to use these weapons. Whereas if the Iranian regime were to collapse, I think it would collapse into a more pro-Western democratic type state. I think the theocracy in Iran would collapse into something more pro-Western, whereas I think you're right, Pakistan, if it were to collapse, would go into something that's far, far worse than it is now, and there's definitely a fear there. And I think Pakistan is becoming increasingly more anti-American. They've been far more vocal about their resentment towards the states, ultimately, than, at least from my relatively limited perception, in terms of what Iran has been saying, at least of late. I think you're right. What happened, you know, when, uh, after September 11th, in George W. Bush went around and said, you know, you're with us, you're against us. I think Musharraf in Pakistan made a calculation that, you know, if we're against the United States, then it's going to cost us a lot more in the long run. And he said, well, you know, we're going to be with you. But I think he and the Pakistanis were in a tough situation where they said, you know, we can't openly oppose the United States. We don't want to go the route of, of an Iran or Iraq or whatnot, but we can't 100 percent go for him. So I think maybe he thought he was buying time. Figured he'd try to play the United States, help them out where they can, but then, you know, have his intelligence agencies go in the other direction. But yeah, I think Pakistan is. I think they made a decision and they're trying to play both sides. And maybe what we're seeing now is they're essentially calling us to task. And to an extent, we're calling them to task because there's been some pretty hard rhetoric, not just from the right, but from Hillary Clinton as well, on whether or not the, the Pakistanis are really our ally and whether or not they really need to, whether we need to really reevaluate that relationship. And I think that's what's happening is we're both starting to reevaluate our relationship. And several people on the, uh, in the Republican field have said that they don't really think Iran is, uh, sorry, Iran, they don't really think Pakistan is an ally. And perhaps they're not. I mean, you know, Osama bin Laden, bin Laden is hiding in a compound there for four or five years, right where your military uh, academy is and all that. It kind of begs the question. 
We're going to move on to the next, the, uh, next article on our news segment, and that is Occupy-inspired campaign urges boycott on Black Friday. And it says Occupy Wall Street-inspired protesters are eyeing a new target, Target, and dozens of other companies. The campaign under the name Occupy Black Friday is trying to enlist supporters to boycott just about every major retailer. Now, I got a couple of strong opinions on this. As of 11 o'clock on Thanksgiving evening, so about an hour before the Black Friday sales uh, went nuts, as they normally do every year, the Occupy Black Friday Facebook page had about 1,900 likes. Now, compare that to the Occupy Sesame Street website, uh, Facebook page that had 44,000 likes. So, Michael, I guess, is this really news? I mean, when it seems to not be such a big deal, 1,900 likes on Facebook, if our society has gotten to the point where we judge uh, value based on Facebook likes? Uh, I Unfortunately, I think that there's a certain amount of uh, what analytical honesty there. I, you know, given the exception that I don't know how long that page was up on Facebook relative to the Occupy Wall Street page, but uh, nonetheless, in spite of that, the kind of publicity or the the you know popularity contest that that implies, I think that there is a point basically to the Occupy position relative to Black Friday, and I think that in this day and age, I mean, we could really spend a lot of time talking about America and American identity relative to consumer culture and how we define ourselves as consumerists. And, you know, to that extent, certainly uh, not shopping on Black Friday is its own kind of, however minor, you know, statement of resistance. So I think to a degree, whether or not it's popular on Facebook or whether 12-year-olds you know, look up Occupy as much as they do Justin Bieber or uh, Selena Gomez, uh, I still think that there's a certain nugget of truth that we need to more or less soberly considered that to not consume itself in the 21st century is its own, albeit minor form of, of resistance. And I think Occupy has a point to, it, to the extent that you know, why not sit this one out? Why not basically see what happens? Do you, do you do disagree with that point? Do you disagree with the kind of idea of, you know, another way to put it, Tony, basically, if I may, I'm sorry, I'm taking a lot of time here, but no, another way to put it basically is to think about uh, its own form of austerity, right? Why not kind of practice austerity now? Get a jump on what's basically coming at us on the horizon in terms of the austerity measures that are going to be put into place or activated, so to speak, and not shop. You know, find alternatives. I mean, last week, my wife and I spent a simple Thanksgiving. We didn't even go out and buy the turkey. You know, we basically spent time and simplified. And I think that there's an almost philosophy there, not just this idea of not consuming, but there's a kind of philosophy there as well of, you know, in these times, why not try other uh, uh, methods of engagement with your family instead you know, of going out on Black Friday and doing the whole thing, you know? But he, here, I'll, I'll give you two counterpoints on that. On the one hand, if people want to be austere and not spend money, that that's all up to them. But, you know, the whole idea of Black Friday sales, you know, just so, for everyone out there to know, the history of the term Black Friday, do Ed and Michael, do you know where that came from? I have a feeling I'm about to find out. I think we are. I've no, you I are. haven't heard. <laughs> Black Friday traditionally was, and I think still is in many cases, the day of the year that the retailers nationwide went from being in the red to being in the black. Sure. So it's a very, very uh, real, I guess it's a term that has a history to it and a very realistic uh, appreciation of it. People want to go out on Black Friday. They want to shop. They want to get some deals. I mean, the fact that you're going out for a Black Friday sales, I understand austerity, but I mean, that that's good old... Yankee ingenuity. I mean, that's being the good, solid Yankee trader and wanting to be out there and get a, you know, get a good deal. And I think they're trying to attack something that has become beyond just buying and beyond consumerism. People just like going out and lining up at midnight. And as you know, people who have experience in the movie theater industry, as I do, you know that people just like to line up at midnight for things that some of us think are totally stupid. Now, I'll tell you, I have never gone out at midnight for a Black Friday sale. I am never going to. I could care less about going out and saving $100 to $200 on a TV. To be honest with you, I would much rather sleep in and be warm and spend the extra $200. But they're targeting these retailers, and they're trying to say that there are elements of corporate greed. And listen, the reason they're open is because we're consuming. Just the reason our movie theaters are open on Christmas and Thanksgiving is because people go. So I think they're attacking retailers. More importantly, if you're out there and you're actually trying to protest and try to occupy one of these stores – all you're doing is pissing off the people at the bottom end of the spectrum who have to work the midnight shift, who have to work with all these crazy crowds of people. 
And I just I, I understand their their desire for change, and I understand their frustration with the system. But attacking businesses is just not going to work. I mean, let's say hypothetically, if this was hugely successful and, and Black Friday sales were down thirty percent over last year, what would happen? The economy would start tanking. Unfortunately, retail is a big part of our economy, and people should spend time with their families. But we need to look at what we're trying to do. I mean, you don't have a right. Real. I, I, let me rephrase that. You're, everyone has a right to protest. And if you have a specific business and you think that they're terrible and they're wrong, whatever, go absolutely right. Occupy their store, do whatever you want. But it, it, it's, it's retail as a whole. I mean, it's, it's buying presents. You know, for a lot of people out there in these lines going to these Black Friday sales, you know what it is? It's they want to get a deal to buy somebody they love, something they want, exchanging gifts, giving gifts. And, and it's just I think they're, they're directing their anger again, at retail, because if you notice earlier on in the year, it was Wall Street, and now it's, well, it's these companies that are funded by Wall Street. Maybe eventually they'll get down to Congress, which is the real problem, but again, I just think they're hitting the mark, they're not, they're not hitting the mark, I think they're missing the mark. I mean, it's, it's, these stores are there to sell to people because people want to buy the goods. Well, in a sense, I mean, it's an age-old chicken and egg argument. I, you know, one could be flippant and say that they just want to protest anything with the word wall in it, uh, Walmart being public enemy number two, I suppose, next to Wall Street. Uh, but I don't see it necessarily as a site-specific protest. I don't see it necessarily as a business-specific protest. I think, and I may be the idealist here, but uh, I think that they're trying to crack or put some kind of crack in the sensibility of consumerism as a whole. And Black Friday may be a necessary ploy for businesses to compensate for you know, the dearth of sales over the course of a year, and I understand that. Uh, but I personally, I mean, I can certainly speak for myself and, and what I witness in general is that, that there's a mania surrounding Black Friday now, that it has become something of a, of a psychological symptom that we are compensating for some kind of lack that we feel as American citizens, combined with the fact that, as I say, you know, in this country, citizenship is so intrinsically bound with consumerism that, again, uh, if we were to try to challenge that or to break it, I think it has a lot more to do with saying, you know, Walmart's business practices or their labor practices are anti-American or this or that. I think it has much more to do with the far more profound, if abstract, idea of we need to break this uh, artificially constructed bond between you know, American as consumer and American as citizen. And I'll just give you one little anecdote too, not necessarily in relation to that specifically, but on the, uh, the Best Buy near my house, they had all the people waiting in line, you know, the 100 or so people camping out two, three days before Black Friday, and they had their own little tents, and somebody even had a sign hanging on the tent saying, Occupy Best Buy. So there's a sense of, you know, that that is a kind of mentality that, really needs to be uh, dissembled, so to speak. Well, because, this I, because the, well, the idea that, that Occupy is a genuine form of resistance, however unformed their philosophy may, may itself be. But the, the threat there is basically that, you know, Occupy Wall Street is almost automatically being mocked by something like that, that it's being assimilated into the kind of superficial pop culture sensibility. And, you know, there's a real danger on the opposite side of it. You see what I'm saying there? No, you're, I, I think you're right in a sense. But, I mean, maybe it's that the Occupy Wall Street movement really wasn't as big or as influential as people felt or, or, or thought it was. It's just – I guess I'll leave you with this, and it's a little bit of a left-handed comment for me to leave you with. But, you know, they're out there wanting to occupy retailers and fight against consumerism and corporate greed. And all that's great. But you know what? Every time I walk through downtown Boston or downtown New York – I see a lot of homeless people. I see a lot of sick people. And you know what? All the protests against consumerism and big businesses and Wall Street, it's not doing a damn thing. And maybe some of these, uh, you know, these, these occupiers, however well-intentioned they are, should stop trying to occupy and protest and try to do something more productive. I mean, there are homeless shelters out there that need help. There are food banks out there that need help. There are elder services agencies that need help. There, there's jobs waiting to be done with the, or jobs that need hands to do them. And there's a lot of service that can be provided. And I don't know, maybe my, my pessimistic view of protesting is that it's, it's the tool of a different generation that wanted to sit around and just protest. And maybe we should focus on being socially active as opposed to, you know, politically active, coming from the political scientist. Sure. 
Well, again, I think Occupy uh, needs its own show. Uh, if we can insert that into, there's another, you know, for, right. for future reference. I, and I think it needs its own focus because what's happening now, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll be honest with you, I, I have a certain amount of ambivalence relative to the Occupy Wall Street movement. On the one hand, we have not seen any kind of revolution uh, on the scale. And you can throw the Tea Party in there to a certain extent. I happen to think that the Tea Party was co-opted literally the day after it sprung up more or less organically. Uh, and that's something that has yet to happen with Occupy Wall Street. Um, on the one hand, you have not seen this kind of groundswell, and I don't want to use the word revolution, maybe that's too extreme a word, but let me use it as a kind of, you know, for, for lack of a better term. You haven't seen this degree of, uh, let's say, outrage transformed into a movement, to my mind, certainly in my lifetime, and certainly since the late 60s. And so what's happened really, in the, you know, given the relative apathy or the increase of apathy that we've experienced, I think really from my perspective since the Reagan era, it seems to me that you have this confluence of outrage coming from both the right and from the left that is more or less unformed, it's undisciplined, there's certainly a lack of political uh, or philosophical rigor there. But just the fact that we are paying any attention to anything happening on any kind of revolutionary scale, to me, is a breath of fresh air. And it's going to be interesting to follow where it goes from here. Uh, and as I say, I, I will agree with you, Tony, on this to this extent that Occupy can kind of shake its fist at everything. And on the one hand, it's shaking its fist at consumerism, which in and of itself is relatively unfocused. But just the fact that it's shaking its fist to me means something. Does that, is that, does, does that make sense? It does. I, I tell you, the one point I will agree with you on, I, I think, if anything, it's an indication that for whatever reason, people on the right and people on the left aren't happy with the, with, the, with the status quo. And they weren't happy with the status quo under uh, George W. Bush. So you go from a – and George W. Bush in reality was a moderate Republican, but you go from Bush to Obama, and, and a good segment of the country is still just not happy. And I think there's no one in the – you know, people on both sides aren't happy, and I don't think people in the middle are very happy either. Why it's not turning into some type of a, a larger movement – who knows? And I think you're right. I think, you know, to an extent, the Tea Party was co-opted by the Republican Party, understandably so. And I think you're starting to see, and it's been a little bit more tentative, but, you know, with Elizabeth Warren in Massachusetts trying to start to co-opt the, the Occupy movement. And I, I think maybe that's something that's going to continue to go because there's still this big center of, of the, you know, establishment on both sides that wants to keep things in the uh, in the loop. And I'll give you a quick example. Tell me if you agree with that. I think it, that is best shown in how the media has ignored Ron Paul. I'm not a big Ron Paul fan. I like the guy. I think he's a smart guy. He's one of the smarter people on the stage. But time and time again, he, he will poll very well, and then he would get, up until this last debate, very, very little time. And I think it's maybe people on both sides are, are you know afraid of somebody who's genuinely offering a very different perspective. I mean, if you look at Ron Paul's views on a lot of things, they're not very much in line with the mainstream Republican Party, and they're not really in line with the mainstream Democratic, uh, mainstream party line of the Democrats. So I think maybe you're right. There, there's a, and again, I'm not one given to conspiracy theories, but there's definitely a um, discussion or, or there's definitely a problem with, with real change in this country. I just wish, and, and again, I, I would take, uh, I think, serious umbrage with the categorization of Elizabeth Warren as being at least directly connected with Occupy Wall Street. As I say, there's a certain maybe... Uh, according to the what the Carl Rove ad that's certainly running in Massachusetts, there's a certain intellectual sympathy or intellectual correspondence between what Elizabeth Warren has been pushing uh, with um, consumer reform uh, and and what you know Occupy is at least loosely claiming to be its mantle. I think that there's a certain amount of of of, of uh, comparison to be made there, but for the most part, for me, Elizabeth Warren is perfectly reasonable mouthpiece for her own position. Whereas Ron Paul, is, he's interesting because, you know, 95% of everything Ron Paul says, I disagree with violently. And then, of course, his, certainly his military position and his whole, again, talking about occupying, the whole, his whole attitude towards the Middle East and the idea that we don't belong there is, you know, that to me is like raw meat, and I, and I kind of feast on that as well. The problem with someone like Ron Paul is that they put him on the stage and he's like crazy grandpa. You know, you drag him out and he doesn't, I think, appeal to the kind of banal middle America that is looking for a reasonable mouthpiece. I think what's really threatening about Elizabeth Warren is that she actually sounds reasonable when she speaks, whether you agree with her, disagree with her. 
And I think that she has this kind of degree of rationality to her presentation, and there's a certain methodology to the way in which she presents her point of view that ultimately is, 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 is found to be more threatening versus someone like a Ron Paul. And, and it's just to say that Ron Paul comes off as being overly eccentric, and he doesn't really find, try to find that way to appeal to the, to the, to the center, so to speak. Uh, much like back when they had Dennis Kucinich on in the debates, you know, back in the last election cycle, uh, the presidential election cycle, where they're asking him whether or not he believed in UFOs. You know, you get these people up there, and then they turn them into caricatures. They're finding, uh, I think, a considerable difficulty in categorizing Elizabeth Warren uh, as a kind of cartoon figure. Right. I think um, one of the challenges there, Michael, are you from Massachusetts originally? Yes. One of the problems with people like Elizabeth Warren is, is that we, or I should say it's us, we in Massachusetts tend to generally have a very politically weird view of the world. Even we, we, for instance, were fanatically in favor of Ted Kennedy. Massachusetts loved Ted Kennedy. Around the rest of the country, people thought we were nuts. So not, not to knock Elizabeth Warren, but I think she's a Massachusetts liberal candidate that will do well here. Makes sense to us in Massachusetts. Rest of the country, people look at us like we're nuts. Well, she only has to get elected to the Senate, right? So <laughs> she only needs the Massachusetts vote. That's true. But let's move on. We're going to do one more quick news article before we move on to our, our next deeper look section. And this article is uh, from the Irish Times. We're going to try to bring you something international every year. Uh, excuse me, every year. Try to bring you something from the international side every episode just to sort of let you know what's going on out there in the world. And again, this is from the Irish Times, Stephen Collins, political editor. editor. It says, Taoiseach insists growth is key as he promises 100,000 new jobs by 2015. So I'm going to let everyone out there know a little bit. Um, first, to introduce you a little bit about Irish politics and the Irish political system. The term I just used, Taoiseach, and my pronunciation is probably terrible, is pronounced T -A, is spelled T-A-O-I-S-E-A-C-H, and it is the term used for the Irish prime minister. So the article would otherwise say, prime minister insists growth is key. And the article talks a little bit about what the... Um, some of the plans the Irish government has over the next couple of years to start to get growth going. And one of the interesting things I noticed here was they're establishing a microfinance fund to generate about up to $150 million in microenterprise lending. And that's something that has worked very well in the third world, both in the nonprofit sector and in the private sector. And it hasn't really taken off in the West the way it has in other parts of the world. And I think because if you think of microfinancing, it's very hard to microfinance anything in this country. But um, again, it's an indication that the government is, is moving towards spending and loaning more money. But uh, Michael, do you have an opinion on whether or not you think that's going to work? Not necessarily for the Irish, but for us, because we seem to get bogged down on whether or not the government should spend more or lend more. But in reality, the government is lending money at 0% to banks, and they keep spending, and we're not seeing any growth from it. Well, I think maybe if we are, first, first of all, I don't think that we've, we're spending enough. And I know that sounds you know, radically irresponsible, but... Uh, I think it's been effectively proven. One of the ground rules about economics is that you know if you uh, for every dollar that's basically put into uh, the pockets of the working man or woman, uh, you know you find something like one and a half times of that being then turned around and spent uh, uh, in the economy. And, and again, as the consumers that I so actively rail against. But the idea basically is that you need to stimulate the economy, and the only way to do it is to basically spend considerable considerably in the short term in order to stimulate in the long term. But we're such a short attention span culture that we don't see the, the, the positive results of that process because it, it grinds, I suppose, a little bit too slowly and we were so kind of fixed on the sound bite of, you know, and, and all too willing to uh, claim that the uh, stimulus is a failure, whatever re relative stimulus program that we're trying to put into place is a failure. So I think that's an active problem. Um, combined with the fact that we're probably spending, you know, too much money in all of the wrong places on tax cuts, you know, uh, or for that matter, you know, bailing out the banks at zero percent interest. I don't know the, the Irish model. I mean, you'd probably given, you know, what you've looked at and probably your, you know, relative knowledge uh, on that subject is concerned. You probably have a far better understanding about it. But if there's some comparison to be made between what's happening in Ireland and in America, I think that that model could could potentially work. And it may also likely, likely work because their economy is so much smaller. It, it, you have more to say about the um, the relative similarities between the two are there are there similarities to be made there are i think one of the things is you know you're taking keynesian economics i guess for for granted or perhaps i do but ireland is a small country four and a half million people and they have a unitary state so they can sort of direct everything right from the top and i think the problem is is that 
in in a case like Ireland, maybe that can work because again, you're talking about a country not much bigger than the state of Maine, about four and a half million people. And it, it's small enough that, you know, the government can marshal all of its resources. I think when you try to apply something like this to the United States, we're so big and the economy is so large and just the physical size of the country and 330 million Americans and, and the coast to coast and then those states that hang off the sides there, Alaska and Hawaii, if you want to call them states. Um, I, appendages. I, I, appendages. That's a great term for them. The appendage states, uh, although I consider Rhode Island appendage. But anyway. <laughs> I think that this is, you know, it makes sense for Ireland. It's a smart business idea. It's a smart government idea. I think the problem is sometimes we look at this and say, why can't we do this in the United States? And the truth of the matter is we're so different. We're so much bigger. And I think a certain part of the problem, you know, maybe a quarter of it, maybe a fifth of it is, is you know, that we are sort of, we do have a short-term mindset and we are sort of stuck in the, the you know, I think they say we can't do anything longer than 10 years in this country nowadays and we can't really look down the road and we can't really agree and do something. And I think, you know, not to get into a debate about health care, but I think you're seeing that with health care that, you know, Obama's health care law gets passed. And then if a Republican is elected president, it's likely to get, you know, uh, rescinded in another year. So, again, how do you go from we're going in this direction? No, no, no. Then we're going in this direction. And we're bouncing back and forth. But I think it's interesting to know and to see what the rest of the world is doing. But I just think that the United States is too big and too complex for nice and easy, simple solutions like that. Well, I think, and also, again, with the health care reform debate, uh, as you mentioned, it, it would probably most likely be repealed before a considerable amount of it is even enacted. So, you know, there's a problem there because, again, these things grind slowly. Uh, reform grinds slowly. Uh, progressive um, legislation takes a considerable amount of time to be enacted in the first place. So, you know, I think I would certainly agree with you to that extent. But I think also in this country, we have... Um, this attitude where I don't know where it comes from, and maybe you have a general um, um, understanding of this or, or you have a general response, but why aren't we, for example, putting in high-speed rail? Why aren't we spending the money now on something which I think almost in black and white terms would facilitate uh, progress in this country? Why aren't we doing what would seem to me the obvious thing? What is it about, uh, I would define it, again, almost neoconservative or even radical right-wing intransigence. Why aren't we investing technologically in our infrastructure? Do you, I mean, that's a grand question and it's a bit it of is, a left it, field it, question, but, it, but why is that happening? What is that phenomenon? I think it has to do with the fact that the United States is different and that we're unique and that we want to adopt European and Asian models and people need to come to the conclusion that we need to do what works for America. And, you know, high-speed rail, I think it's great. But you know what? No high-speed rail is going to get me from here to L.A. faster than a plane. We have always been a car culture, for instance. And I hate sitting in traffic in my car as much as anyone else does. We're also, you know, we're a culture. I think we travel. But in reality, even if I could get to New York in an hour and a half, I don't necessarily know if people are going to get to New York, uh, go to New York that much more often. And then D.C., which is an eight-hour drive or a seven-hour train ride, yeah, it'd be great if we could get to D.C. or Philly in, you know, three hours. But again, we're not a culture that gets up on a train and takes a train somewhere. Now, if you go to Europe, you run around through the U.K. or Ireland, you're everywhere from bus station to train station. But I think when we look at our country, think of places like Montana and Wyoming in these huge, huge open spaces covering hundreds and hundreds of miles. Trains just don't work the way that they do everywhere. Again, high-speed rail is a great idea, but – its use is going to be limited. we got to ask ourselves, well, why are we doing high-speed rail? Is there really that much of a need for people to get to Boston, to Hartford in, you know, 45 minutes? What the hell's the point? You know, you look at things like Skype and in, in how companies can have meetings via Skype and you can talk to people over the Internet. Do we need to get on a train and waste all that time and energy and, and take the train? And Yeah, it's great. It's going fast. But I just don't think those things apply to America the way they do in Japan, where they've got a great bullet train system and, and China's system is experiencing some problems. But it's Europe. I think our infrastructure is different and we're a different country. I think that money, you know, again, if you want to go to Montana, you're not getting on a train. And it doesn't matter how fast of a bullet train that is. It can't beat a plane to Montana. It can't beat a plane to Wyoming. Who the hell would want to go there anyway? But uh, Texas or Florida, again, the distance from Boston to Tallahassee is the equivalent of going from like Madrid to Warsaw, if, if further even. So it, it's just we cover far, much farther distances. We're a big country. 
And that's why I think those things don't necessarily uh, work in the United States. Things like uh, high-speed rail. What's the point of it? What do we need it for? Sure, it'd be great, but do we want to spend billions of dollars on it when it's easier to fly or it's easier to get in your car and drive? Maybe that's our American independent spirit. Maybe it's not. But I just think a lot of the things around the world that we see that we like that we wish we could do. And, and I'll agree with you. It's great that you can take trains and buses anywhere in Europe and it's so much easier. And here, you know, we're weirdos we, or people that get on buses and trains are kind of looked at as weirdos. And we're just I don't know. It's an efficiency factor, I guess. I don't know. I think there's a certain inevitability there. I mean, the, 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 in terms of global competition. I don't know if high-speed rail is necessarily the best example along those lines, but we just see the world outpacing us, and it's and it's the whole concern about modernity in the 21st century, you know, well, that we need to basically keep pace at a technological rate, and it just the, seems to me that we're not even willing to invest in those projects. We're not even willing to allow them to fail well, should they fail. <laughs> part of the problem is if you look at um, – South Sudan, uh, I forget what they're calling themselves, but the, the world's newest country, so to speak, they're, um, when they eventually build an airport, it's going to be a big, beautiful, modern airport. Problem with the United States is when you advance early, and we did technologically, you end up running into problems day, later, later down the road. And Boston is a great example of this. Boston had one of the first subway systems in the country, and, and it's a subway system that by and large still works. But if you go down to D.C., Man, Boston system cannot hold a, a, a glass of water to the D.C. system. The stations in D.C. are big and they're bright and they're modern and it's fast and it's efficient. And then we have the green line and the red line in Boston, which for those of you, if you've never been on the system in Boston, the green line is a, an old trolley system. But Boston was first in the nation to have that subway. And the problem with that is 100 years later, now we have an old crappy subway. Boston's Logan Airport is right in the center of the city. In most cities around the world, the airports are located outside the city. Why is that? Logan was a very old, uh, originally a very old airport. And I think that's a challenge that we're facing that, you know, we have all these phone lines and electrical lines strung all over the country, whereas as newer countries have moved toward it, they've put their lines underground because, you know, we had electricity before they did. And that's how you did electricity back in the 30s and 40s. And, and now they're able to sort of leapfrog us. So I think there's the potential that hopefully it won't cost us too much in the forerun. But, you know, there, there's a problem with being the first to advance, so to speak, is that, you know, eventually people catch up and they're able to build something that's a little bit newer and a little bit nicer because our systems end up being older. So I, I guess there, there's a price that comes for being the first to reach the finish line because eventually somebody else hits that line before, uh, you know, ahead of you. Well, but, well Boston's a bit of a, a, an exception to the extent that, you know, part of its charm is its provincialism and how antiquated so much in the city is, really. I mean, if you if you ride on the Green Line, it's it's no different, really, than riding the haunted house at Coney Island. I mean, it yeah. feels the same, you know. So, so I mean, there's a certain amount of, of, uh, of a charm there. I just think that, you know, and, and again, you could break the United States up into, into regions, right? And I think that it would be vital to have something like a high-speed rail between Boston and New York. And for that matter, down to Washington, D.C., rather than taking the Chinatown bus, which is the equivalent of taking your life into your hands for ten dollars <laughs> a ride. Uh, but I think I think you need the, that connection first. Let's at least put it this way, uh, relative to certain regions in the country. I think in tourism in something like Florida, I think a high speed rail would be ideal. Uh, again, I don't know what's happening with the what the Harry Reid proposed line between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. But some of those. Um, uh, high-speed rail proposals seem to make perfectly logical sense to me. And I think that we should at least try it. I think we should, you know, experiment a little bit in terms of investing in that kind of infrastructure project and just see how it, how it, how it goes. I mean, we had, again, Eisenhower, somebody the Republicans, I wish, would hold up as, you know, one of the more reasonable mouthpieces for the party, you know, 50 years ago, built the interstate highway system, you know, and that was a Republican... Uh, project and there had to be a certain amount of risk involved in that invest in investment and it paid off richly but hold on I'll, I'll tell you one quick thing before we move on to our next section the interstate highway system was designed as a system to move military forces quickly from one part of the country to the other in the event of a russian or other attack so there was a far more well in part meeting, but it wasn't but it but certainly wasn't building, sold that way well uh even I think if you if you look at some of the documents from back then, there there was a we need this to be able to do it. Obviously, to to get people to agree along, you tell them, hey, you can drive, you know, straight from Boston to New York in in four hours or so. But um, I, I guess well, again, we'll have to uh, agree to disagree. I think high speed rail is 
is nice. I just don't know if all of a sudden you had the best high-speed rail system in the world, if it would really make much of a difference in America. I don't think that's what's holding the economy back. I don't think that's what's going to, you know, get the economy going. And more importantly, I mean, I don't think a, the, the best high-speed rail system in the universe is going to help a homeless man find a home or, you know, an elderly person sitting alone in a nursing home without anyone visiting them. I mean, I don't think that's going to change that. I don't think that's going to change drug abuse and, and sexual abuse in our country. I think a lot of the issues we have just aren't going to be solved by a high-speed rail system. But again, that's just my opinion. We'll probably have to agree to disagree. All right, next up here on Viewpoint, we have our full disclosure editorial. And just to let the listeners know out there what the full disclosure editorial is, it's a full disclosure that it is absolutely an editorial. It is completely opinion. It is not necessarily based in fact. It may be anecdotal, but it is just somebody's opinion. It doesn't get, it doesn't get responded to. We sometimes will have two. There'll be different topics on an issue, but just a full disclosure of somebody's own opinion. And today, that's going to be mine. And we're going to talk briefly, or I'm going to talk briefly, about why not saying Merry Christmas, in my idea, makes you a racist and a traitor. So first, you know, Christmas is a religious holiday to an extent. It's important to Christians. It's also important to Muslims because they do regard Jesus as the, uh, the second greatest prophet, so to speak. And I'm sure Jews wouldn't be too miffed by it either, considering that Jesus was a Jew and he was a really good guy. So reality, you know, that's more than 2 billion people in the world. So if you're, if you're bothered by it, you know, there's something wrong with you. The real issue, though, is Christmas, whether you like it or not, is a federal holiday. It has the same legal status as the 4th of July, as Veterans Day, as Martin Luther King Day. If you object to saying Merry Christmas, you must, if you're logically consistent, object to other federal holidays. If courts have the right to say that you can't say Merry Christmas, then they could just as well say you can't say Happy Martin Luther King Day, which in my idea makes you a racist. They're all federal holidays. You don't have to necessarily celebrate them. You don't have to do what you want with them. But if you say that I can make a town take down a Merry Christmas uh, uh, ornament or whatever or sign, then I can make people say take down Happy Martin Luther King Day. And is that really where we want our country to go? And last but not least, and this is what bothers me the most, Christmas Day, which if you look at its historic and religious roots is a day of miracles, has a very, very critical role in American history. Do you out there in podcast land know why Christmas is perhaps the most important and the most American of holidays after the 4th of July? A guy whose name is George Washington, our first and greatest president, crossed the Delaware after camping out in Valley Forge on Christmas night, 1776. It was a miracle crossing. It was a miracle that they were able to attack the Hessians and the British. And it was quite possibly the one single turning point in the Revolutionary War. If we had lost that day, if Washington had not crossed the Delaware in the freezing cold weather and the icy water, our country would not be here today. So while you may look at Merry Christmas and say, geez, that's so offensive, I'm not a Christian, or whatever it is, or government shouldn't do this or that with religion, I say thank God or thank whoever you want for Christmas, because that's the day that George Washington crossed the Delaware, and that's an important day to me as the 4th of July. So that's our full disclosure editorial. You're a racist and a traitor if you don't believe in saying Merry Christmas. I have just one question, Tony. Sure. Did... George Washington give birth to the baby Jesus when he reached the other side? He did. Okay. Just making sure. George Washington is, is, you know, like the American Jesus. He really is the greatest president, if that's the case. Um, <laughs> but we're going to move on now to a brief election update in our election update headquarters. And we're going to talk briefly about Newt Rising. Where did he come from and why? Why he may be likely to stick or not stick? And will his recent stance on immigration hurt him? And why he may be the man to unite the Republicans and beat Obama? And why he won't just go back. <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms of where Newt came from and why, if you look at the last presidential election, the establishment of the Republican Party went for Romney, and the base went for Huckabee, and the compromise candidate ended up being John McCain. John McCain wasn't anyone's favorite. Not everyone loved John McCain, but, you know, the base picks their candidate and they refuse to go for the establishment candidate and the establishment picks their candidate and they refuse to go for the base candidate. So oftentimes you end up with a compromised candidate. And it was John McCain last time because, again, John McCain didn't thrill anyone, but nobody really hated the guy either. And I think that's what's happening with Newt this time. 
The base has and always has stuck with Romney. I'm sorry, the, the establishment has always stuck with Romney. The base has shifted a bit, but Herman Cain recently, and Herman Cain is still polling high. The, the media seems to have now wanted to discount him, but he's still polling very close to Romney. And, you know, he's sort of that base candidate. The, the conservative base of the party wants a strong conservative candidate. Then you got to look at who the compromise candidate is, because I think the conservatives will accept Newt, and I think the base will accept Newt as well. So it might be that he ends up winning out because he's the one candidate that both sides can agree on. And in terms of why he's likely to stick around, I guess Newt, I think, ran an interesting campaign because he very early on had a lot of trouble with the campaign and said he was going to run this this fantastic, weird, special, strange campaign that nobody had ever seen. And I think he was just a realist about it. He figured as long as he hangs into the primaries, eventually other people will drop out. Eventually, he'll get the notice. People will want to focus with him. And all he's going to do is hang in until it gets closer to the primary dates, win a couple primaries, and then he's golden. And I think to an extent, it makes sense. Michael, do you have any uh, opinion on that, not being a fan of Newt? Uh, I don't know where to begin, really, with Newt Gingrich. uh, Because, again, as with so many other things, this could easily take up the uh, bulk of an entire show. But I'm still astounded. It's almost like, uh, I don't know if you read Naomi Klein's Shock Doctrine. But having Newt Gingrich around is like a shock to the system. It's, it's unfathomable that Gingrich is where he's at now. And the idea that he's polling seems to be some kind of Ashton Kutcher prank. It just doesn't seem real. I'm trying to figure out you know, when it is exactly I'm going to wake up and discover that uh, Newt is just that specter haunting my political nightmares every other night. Um, the thing is about Gingrich is that he fits in really, to be honest, he kind of fits in with the neoconservative evolution. And in, I suppose in many respects, all kidding aside, he's not uh, all that unlikely a candidate relative to where the GOP is now in terms of its, from my point of view, again, uh, relatively extreme point of view. I mean, given something like Contract with America, going back to the 90s, he, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but it seems to me the contract uh, with America, or as certain liberals like to refer to it as contract on America, uh, Gingrich kind of started the whole kind of Grover Norquist taking a pledge thing that we're stuck with now, where candidates, in order to even have the funding or the backing to run for the presidency, they have to take the pledge not to raise taxes. That whole kind of attitude, uh, kind of political game playing started more or less from Newt Gingrich and the whole idea of contract with America, forcing uh, politicians basically to take a pledge. I will be in favor of a line item veto. I will be, you know, I will not raise taxes, blah, blah, blah. That seems to me that that all started with Gingrich. So to a certain extent, Gingrich in, in, in many respects was a kind of architect for where the party is now. Now, feel free to violently disagree. I don't know exactly what your take on Gingrich is, but uh, from a liberal perspective, it seems utterly ludicrous that Gingrich is as big as he is. But I suppose from in a kind of uh, conservative evolutionary perspective, he makes perfect sense. Well, he does. I, you know, the GOP is not as conservative as you would claim it to be. If you look at the history of the party dating back to the 20s, the split between the conservative base and the establishment base, it dates back to the 20s. And, and it's come and it's gone. So if you were to look at it, say, 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, it, it is definitely shifted far, far to the left compared to where it used to be. But Newt, I think, makes sense because, again, he's got that political experience. He's somebody that conservatives can say, well, you know, he's a smart guy. He makes a difference. He, he has ideas about how to change things. We can go with this. And I think the base says, hey, you know, Newt's not running around, you know, yelling crazy stuff. And, and he's not, you know, crazy old grandpa yet. So I think he does make sense. And his biggest, or I shouldn't say his biggest, one of his uh, big advantages is, you know, he did work with Clinton. He did get a balanced budget signed. The economy did grow while Newt was Speaker of the House. And he can say, I, as Newt Gingrich, have actually had to work with Democrats work with the other party and make real differences. If you look at welfare reform in the 90s, which everyone pretty much agrees, if you look at it now, was a phenomenal idea. You had a Republican House under Gingrich, and then you had the Democrat in the White House, Bill Clinton. They agreed to it, and it was a good thing for the country, and it was a good change. So I think that's why Newt is is that candidate that maybe people actually might end up being able to, to agree on. I don't know. Gingrich, and again, you have to wonder, because again, I, I think that's much more of a split between 
the rational Republican. And, and just listening to how you speak, Tony, I, I would assume you to be a rational Republican, a rational conservative. It seems to me that there's a split now uh, in which we have the so-called rational conservative uh, perspective, and then we have the rabid neoconservative perspective. And it seems to me a bit of a schizophrenic um, uh, play for people like Gingrich, or for that matter, even Romney, I suppose, where you have to play both the kind of cloth coat conservative of, you know, the kind of early Nixon form, but then you have to play a kind of kooky neoconservative who's going to pledge to make all of these radical uh, uh, reform promises. Um, one of the things that, that uh, Gingrich claimed this past week was about child labor laws and how stupid they are. Uh, maybe stupid is a silly word, but what I take away from that is that he thinks that ch the child labor law is antiquated and that he would do away with it. And for that matter, the whole idea of Gingrich now in effect saying, if I'm president, I promise you all kinds of, you know, from again, the way I understand it, you know, extreme forms of reform. So it seems to me that, that Gingrich is kind of ha trying to have it both ways. On stage at the debates, he's been the voice of reason. And to me, it seems very performative. But let's just say for the sake of argument, he is being the reasonable one, the grown up on the stage who's not you know, overly eccentric. But at the same time, he's making all of these pledges that to me sound quite insidious. And you know, I have to wonder the degree to which you know, he's really going to make good on those kinds of extreme positions. Again, I refer back, back to the contract with America and how nothing altogether became of that per se. I mean, certainly there was welfare reform and another thing, a lot of things that came into play that crossed the aisle between uh, Republicans and Democrats. But it seemed to me the contract with America was a kind of publicity ploy. And I just, I, I wonder basically who the real Gingrich is, I suppose, as you do, I guess, with every politician. But given the level of scrutiny, it seems to me that, that Gingrich is kind of playing both sides. Well, you know, I think what it is is, is Newt's offering specific realistic changes that he feels he can make. You know, Newt's a smart guy. He's got a PhD in history. And I think that's where he comes off is he's going to give you specific. And he has, if you look at his website, a 21st century contract with America, he's giving people specific real ideas of what can change. And some of the things he's talking about, he's the only candidate on both sides that's talking about. I mean, he talks about how the federal government needs to modernize. They need to get into using social media. And if you look at Canada, for instance, their, their whole bailout package or whatever stimulus package we want to call it. There's a website dedicated to it. The government has it very clear what they did, what was done, where the money went. If you go on Treasury's website and try to find that out, forget about it. You're never going to find it. It's too convoluted. He talks about saving money through inefficiencies. And I think some of these issues both sides can agree on. And I think it's because Newt's a smart guy and he looks at it and says, listen, I'm not going to sit there and and talk about what I can't do and what I can't do, or what I can't do, I'm going to give you some specific ideas, because Newt's always been an idea guy, of what he can do. In relation to the child labor law things, I'll give you a, a my own personal perspective on that. I remember being under 18 and wanting to work more, needing to work more. I had to help my family out. I had to cover a lot of my own expenses. And being told when I worked at a movie theater that, you know, I had to leave at 10 o'clock and I had to leave at 930. And, you know, I couldn't come in earlier in the morning. And I couldn't work longer than eight hours. And it used to frustrate the hell out of me. Do I think that Newt honestly thinks he, you know, when he says we need to do away or change child labor laws, does he want to make it so that you can employ five-year-olds at a nickel an hour? No, of course not. But I think when you look at that, the fact that somebody who's, you know, and some of this has to do with Massachusetts specific laws, but if you're 14 or 15, you can't work more than two or three hours a day, or can't work more than three or four hours a day. You can't work after eight o'clock. You can't work before seven o'clock in the morning. And I think it makes it tough if there's some kids out there who want to get out there and have a job and maybe work. And maybe some of them need to. Maybe they need to help a family out that's lost a little, uh, lost some of their money. And again, when I was 16 or 17, I wanted to work as much as I could because I had to. And I was very restricted by these labor laws. I would have worked 15 hours on a Saturday if I could have. But I was told, nope, once you hit your eight hours, you're not allowed to do anymore. So I think he's – you got to – draw the line between what's a comment and what the actual policy is. And I think he's right. I mean, the child labor laws, as they are, do date back several decades, and maybe they do need to be updated. A lot of places out there don't want to hire somebody under 18 because of their schedule restrictions, because of what they legally can and can't do. And maybe we need to look at that and say, hey, you know, an 18, you know, somebody who's 16 or 17, maybe they should be able to work past 10 o'clock on a weeknight if they really want to, or up even till 10 o'clock. So I think that, you know, that's where that comes from. As for the real Newt, I guess you can never really know any political candidate who they really are. And what anyone says in the election is, is not always followed through once they're actually in office. But I think he's a man who has the potential to unite the Republican Party because, again, I think the base will accept him 
and the establishment will accept them. The people that are supporting Romney now, your sort of moderate Republicans, your business Republicans, I think they'll say, yeah, you know, Newt's got a lot of ideas that are going to work for us. And I think the conservative base says, you know what, we, we like the ideas, some of the ideas that Newt has. We like the direction he's going in. So I think he can really, you know, unite the party. And as for beating Obama, he's probably the, one of the stronger candidates to actually do that. Now, Romney always has it going for him that Romney looks very presidential. He sounds presidential. He's Every debate he's been in, he's very well prepared. He can offer that contrast. But, you know, Newt's a very smart guy. And I know I keep saying that and people keep saying that about him. But he understands the history of the government. He understands how the federal government works. And I think people are going to be able to see that that distinction. And I think because he can say in the past he's worked on things with Democrats like welfare reform, he's come across the aisle. I think Newt is not as far to the right as people would think he is. And I think he's just got to kind of coat the base so he can get into the general. And I think in the general, the conservatives will support him. The base of the party will support him. And I think a lot of moderates will say, hey, this guy, Newt Gingrich, keeps coming up with ideas. He's talking about doing something different. And again, when he's on a stage, if he ends up being on stage with Obama, as long as he doesn't come off as too much of a jerk, I think Newt has the the intellectual capacity to really, you know, hammer the president pretty hard. Somebody's got to tell this guy, the, though, that when he's on the stage and debating, that he's got to take the candy out of his mouth. I don't know if you noticed that. That was really obnoxious. I don't know. He was sucking on something on that stage. Well, you know, it may just be that he's um, he's a. Uh, I don't know, maybe his throat gets dry. I mean, we, we as we do these recordings, I often go through a couple of bottles of water myself. So I can imagine it must be tough to sit up there on the stage under the lights. and Or his dentures know. were coming loose. Yeah, or his dentures were possibly coming loose. I mean, you never know. It wouldn't surprise me if he did have dentures. But uh, I, I would just say one last thing, Tony, about the, the child labor. You know, pay these kids you know, a living wage, raise the minimum wage, so that if little Johnny, little 15-year-old Johnny has to go out and support dad who's been unemployed for 99 weeks, at least pay the kid 12 bucks an hour so he can put food on the table rather than having to buy ramen noodles and Kraft macaroni and cheese. You know, uh, you know, counter that. If you're going to make a radical proposal on one extreme, you've got to find a way to compensate that and make that amenable to the working class so that I, they can actually abide by that legislation. Right. I'll go with you just one further. There are a lot of businesses out there and some that I've run that I've had to do the budgets for where if I saw a 50 percent increase in the cost of payroll, wouldn't be able to handle it. Business would go under. So, I, you know, obviously there needs to be a balance. But again, you know, you're a 16, 17 year old kid. You should be allowed to work. How much should you really make? And again, you got to balance between, you know, how much you want them to make. But I don't know, a living wage for 15 and 16 year olds might be tough. I mean, you, you, you've managed 15 and 16 year olds. You know how they can be. What, what, yeah. What it, and, the, yeah, and the, well, that's the problem. You can't expect all that much out of them. All right. Well, that's our election update headquarters. We'll have more for you next time on whether Nude is still rising and where he's going and where the status is. So before we close our show today, we're just going to finish up with our On the Lighter Side segment. And I had the chance this past August to spend a day in Philadelphia. And of course, the night I arrived, I went right to Pat's and Gino's, the two cheesesteak uh, operations in Philly that are world famous. It was late at night and there was a great sense of camaraderie around the people there. There were younger people and older people, tourists and locals and yuppies and college students. I mean, it made me forget a little bit about all the uh, the political troubles swirling around our country. It just felt like a genuine experience. But I have to say, I sampled Geno's and I sampled Pat's. And this is my own opinion here. This isn't a, uh, an endorsement, really. But, well, I guess it's my own personal endorsement. I felt Geno's had the better sandwich. Sorry to anyone who's been there or sorry to any of our listeners out there in Philly, but I just think that Gino's was a, a better sandwich. And, you know, I guess it's, it's one of those things where I, I didn't like the cheese whiz. You know, cheese whiz on a steak and cheese to me is like red clam chowder, which, you know, weirdos outside of New England eat. But, um, yeah, I just think that Gino's wins the cheesesteak war, and that's my opinion. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our inaugural episode of Viewpoint. I want to thank you all for listening and encourage you to check out Basenet Internet Television at basenettv.com. And feel free to contact me, Tony Mizuko, or my co-host, Michael Dow. At... You can reach me, uh, uh, Tony, you can reach me on Facebook. Friend me. Okay, definitely. I'm lonely. <laughs> Friend us both on Facebook. And any questions you want to email in, you can either send them on Facebook or e email us at info at basenettintermedia.com. This is Tony Mizuko signing off. <laughs>